Okay, hi everyone. So uh, let's start with a little bit of motivation, even though you've already seen uh, a little bit in the previous talk. So our story is uh, we're trying to get consensus, doing some kind of uh, agreement protocol, and getting consensus is hard, right? This is something that we've studied for many, many years, and it's still studied today in the context of uh, blockchains and other contexts. And the main challenge is in consensus, you don't know who to trust, right? There's multiple parties. Some of them might be malicious. And it actually, if you're talking about the permissionless setting where we don't have identity verification and anybody can join the protocol, then it's just simply impossible to get a consensus protocol, right? And the reason is that the adversaries can just create multiple copies of themselves. And so they're always in the majority, right? And on the other hand, we know that we need an honest majority to get consensus. So what can we do? So this is, I think, maybe the, the main interesting uh, like new idea that Satoshi Nakamoto had with Bitcoin is that instead of counting people doing a consensus with a majority of people, what we're going to do is count resources. And if we use resources that are publicly verifiable so we can check that somebody actually expended their resource, then now we can switch this assumption from an honest majority of parties to an honest majority of resources. And suddenly the problem becomes uh, possible even in the permissionless setting. So what kind of publicly verifiable resources can we, uh, can we check? So one thing that's uh, very well known, it's used in uh, a lot of cryptocurrencies, but it's known uh, from way before, is proofs of work, right? So these are very, very simple. Uh, they're easy to do. People have implemented them uh, many years ago. But they have a big problem. They're extremely expensive environmentally, right? The, I think Bitcoin usage is now uh, using as much electricity as a medium-sized country. So this is bad. We don't want to use proofs of work. So what else can we do? So one suggestion that's uh, you know, getting more popular is to use money. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know how to get a publicly verifiable proof of sort of regular currency. I can't sh prove to you that I burned dollars. At least they can't do it uh, electronically. Um, but in the context of cryptocurrencies, we actually can uh, prove things like that. This is what's called a proof of stake. I'm sort of using the cryptocurrency money and proving that I've used it. However, these are a bit problematic. They require usually some non-standard assumptions, such as uh, proof of, uh, not proof, just secure erasures. Um, and they also have some inherent vulnerabilities, such as 51% capture attacks so if somebody ever gets a majority of the, of the money in the cryptocurrency, now they'll have a majority forever. There's, we can't tell that this happened, and we can't sort of undo this. So you know, it's not clear that this is uh, completely breaks everything, but it seems bad that this would be the only possible solution. So this is the motivation. We're trying to get a different resource. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, the definition. Of course, it's going to be a little bit hand wavy because uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into any details. And what we want in a proof of space time, ideally, is basically a proof that we used um, disk resources. So what is a disk resource? It, I filled my disk for uh, with a certain amount of space on my disk for a certain amount of time. So we'll always talk now about a unit of time, but this, of course, can be whatever you like. And the amount of resource I expended is the size of the disk times how long I've, uh, I've used it for. So this is why it's space time. Uh, we haven't yet uh, included gravity in this. Uh, <laughs> so in a, in a proof of space time, we have uh, two phases. We have an initialization phase where the prover basically generates the data that they want to fill their disk with. Um, now, why do uh, they have to generate it themselves? It's because we want there to be low communications. So for the things like proofs of replication where I want to use useful data, I actually have to receive all this data to store. But if I'm trying to use a large amount of disk space and I want to keep the communication low, the data has to come from me. So I have to be able to generate it myself. And in the second uh, phase, which we call the execution phase, this is something that we run every unit of time. And I prove that I'm still storing this data. So if I did this correctly, then 
um, I, I've shown you that I filled my disk and that I'm still keeping this disk full uh, for however long I'm running these execution phases. Okay, so that's the ideal. Uh, sadly, we can't quite get that. Why? Because if we have low communication and in the absence of other sort of strange assumptions, um, such as uh, timing assumptions and things like that, right, we can't, um, we can't prove that I've actually stored the data. Why? There's always this simulation attack. I can store small random seed for creating the data, and then instead of storing the, the data, I can just run the initialization phase again with the same seed, and I'll get the same results. So there's no way I can prove that this is not what happened when I run the proof phase. Okay, so this is bad. So what do we actually prove? Instead of proving that I've definitely stored data, we prove an or statement. So either I've actually stored the data, or I've done enough work to reconstruct the data every time. Right, so th this is something that sort of is inherent in the uh, definition. I allow the prover to trade work for uh, space time. Okay, so why is this still good? Why, why can we still use this as a uh, proof of a resource consumption? Well, the idea is that the cost of recreating the data is going to be high. And in particular, it's going to be more than the cost of just storing the data. And if that's the case, then rational parties would rather store the data than recreate it. So in the context of things like cryptocurrencies, this is definitely good enough, right? Because rational parties will store the data, the polar bears, the polar bears will be happy. And it's still okay in terms of security, even if the adversary is not rational, because the cost of the adversary is still going to be high no matter which strategy the adversary chooses. So now our new assumption, instead of an honest uh, majority of disk space or an honest majority of CPU, uh, we're going to assume the combined resources controlled by the honest majority. Um, so when we say uh, the combined resource, we, we have some trade-off factor, however much storage costs, however much CPU costs, and we're talking about the majority in terms of cost. Okay, so what do we actually uh, achieve in this paper? We first get a very, very simple construction of a post. A post is a proof of space-time that's uh, secure in the random oracle model. It doesn't need any other assumptions. This uh, construction has an adjustable initialization difficulty, which means if the price of storage compared to the price of CPU changes, or if I want to increase the length of time that I uh, require parties to store the data, which increase their storage costs, I can also turn a knob and increase the initialization cost to make it still rational to store things. And not only that, we can do this incrementally. So if you've uh, initialized your data with a certain difficulty, and then later we decide that actually, you know, the price of uh, storage has gone up, so it's no longer rational to store things, we need to increase the initialization difficulty, we can do that by just doing the delta work that uh, you need from the initial difficulty to the new difficulty. You don't need to redo everything. Um, and we have a nice market-based mechanism to determine what is the actual difficulty that you need to make it rational. So basically, we can detect if parties are uh, using work instead of storage and use that signal to increase the difficulty when needed. Finally, we've actually implemented this. It's simple enough uh, to use as part of the Space Mesh Consensus Protocol, which is a cryptocurrency based on uh, proof of space time. Okay, so uh, for those of you in the audience who've you know, been in this field for a bit, you know there have been uh, several papers already. Uh, this is a bit confusing. There's, some of them are called proofs of space. This is proof of space time. So what's the difference? Um, well, there are several differences. I think the highlights are the proof of, space, uh, proof of space constructions are fairly complicated. They require uh, these graph pebbling arguments. And uh, actually, to implement them is also a bit more complicated because you need to uh, generate a graph with uh, a certain topology. Whereas our construction, as you'll see in a moment, is extremely simple. And the arguments are just basic uh, information theoretical compression arguments. 
Um, we have an adjustable initialization difficulty, which means, as I said, if you need to increase the length of time, suppose you want uh, the time between proofs to be one week or two weeks or a month, then uh, you can just increase the difficulty of initialization to make it still rational to do that. Whereas the proof of space constructions, their initialization difficulty is actually tied to the size of the graph that you're uh, generating, which means if you want to increase the difficulty, you either need to increase the verification costs or increase the amount of, of uh, data you're storing. Uh, but all is not rosy, it's not that we're strictly better um, the real advantage of these proofs of space is they're very, the prover runs in polylog in the space, so the prover is much more efficient. In our case, the prover actually has to read the entire storage for every proof. So there, these uh, results are actually incomparable, and think of them as working for different parameter regimes. So if you want to have a proof every 10 seconds, you probably don't want a proof of space time, at least not our construction. Um, if you want to have a proof every month, then you probably do want this uh, proof of space time. Okay, what about memory hard functions? Those are also things that are uh, highly related, um, but they're actually doing different things. So these, these are just getting something else. So uh, memory hard function is something that gives you a lower bound for the amount of space or space time even that you're using while you're computing the function. Right, so you have uh, the complexity of the computation itself, whereas the proof of space time gives you a lower bound uh, with this trade-off that I mentioned for the amount of space time you're using between the proof computations. So basically, if you're using a proof of space time, uh, sorry, if you're using a, a memory hard function, right, then there's nothing preventing you from reusing the memory. You can't use it as a proof of space time because you could just use the same memory over and over again. On the other hand, if what you want is a memory hard function, you cannot use a proof of space time because uh, it actually doesn't give any lower bound on the amount of computation. And you'll see our construction actually requires very little memory to compute. Okay, so we've got the, what we want to do out of the way. Now, how do we do it? Um, so the very high level idea is what we're going to store is a table and every entry in the table is going to be a proof of work. Um, and this gives us very fine grained control over the initialization cost because proofs of work, we can tune them exactly how much work do you need to do for each entry and this will say how much work you need to do for the entire table. And it's also very easy to verify that a table entry is a correct proof of work. We just use the proof of work verifier. So that's great. And what do we do in the execution phase? So what we'd like to do is say, okay, the verifier is going to query some random points in this table, and if you didn't store the table, you won't be able to answer them without doing work. But this actually doesn't quite work. Why doesn't this work? Because the prover can actually store nothing, and once the verifier queries, the prover can just reconstruct that particular cell that he queried. So the response to each query will always be correct, but the actual amount of work will be small. They only have to reconstruct a few cells and they don't have to store anything. So this is definitely not a good proof of space time. So what do we actually do for constructing a post? Well, the initialization actually does work like that. We fill the table with proofs of work, but the execution phase is just a little bit different. Basically, what we do is the verifier is going to send a random challenge and the prover is going to commit in the execution phase to the entire table. And now the verifier asks random queries and for each query, the prover needs to show that this is actually uh, the, the position in the table that the prover committed to originally and that this is a good proof of work. And those are both things that are fairly easy to verify. And okay, why does this work? Um, oh, one, one thing to note is that the commitment here is in the execution phase. So every time I do the execution phase, I do a commitment. This is actually what takes us a long time and said I have to read everything. I have to read everything because of this in our construction. It doesn't help at all to commit in the initialization phase because the attack I used previously still works, right? I can commit to the entire table and then forget everything and just reconstruct the things I need um, if, if I uh, only committed in the initialization phase. Okay, so wh why does this work? Again, the, the intuition is very simple. The prover has to decide before uh, responding, before committing basically, which cells of the table it's going to reconstruct if it hasn't stored them already. 
And uh, so we can decide, you know, I'm going to reconstruct some of them, but anything that it didn't reconstruct, it's committed to being bad. And now when it gets a random query, if there's a, a large or significant fraction of the cells that are bad, then it's going to get caught with high probability. So basically what this means is it has to spend either storage to store the cells or CPU to reconstruct the cells. And before the commitment, it has to have a mostly full table. Okay, there are some subtleties. So as I described it, this doesn't quite work. I can't say just use any proof of work and do this. The reason is that the proof of work only says I've used work, but it could be that the proof of work allows the adversary to do some work and then to compress the results. So maybe after doing the entire work to fill the table, I can compress the results to something much smaller than the table. And now I haven't used the storage that I need. So what we need is uh, some notion of incompressible proofs of work. And this is a little bit different from uh, there's of their standard notions of incompressibility because we have a random oracle. So I can't just say, you know, the output of the random oracle is random, it cannot be compressed because uh, I can always query during the decompression the random oracle. So it needs to be incompressible even in the presence of a random oracle. Uh, luckily, the standard uh, proof of work using hash, we show that it is incompressible as long as what we store is just the nonce. We don't store the output of the random oracle because that is, can be very large and I can compress it by only remembering the nonce. So uh, if, that is a, if that's what we do, then this is an incompressible proof and this whole construction does work. Okay, so uh, some things that I haven't shown you in this talk uh, but are in the paper, the market-based uh, mechanism for detecting when users are, uh, are using work instead of storage. And uh, there's this an additional subtlety with how much uh, work I need to fill a, a certain size table. And for some parameters, we actually want to use a different proof of work, also extremely simple, just run the hash once and take a few bits. Um, and we show that that is also incompressible. Now, there are also some uh, open questions, unsurprisingly. Um, one of them is, can we get the best of both worlds in terms of proofs of space and proofs of space time, can we get something that has low prover complexity and also this uh, nice incremental or adjustable even uh, difficulty? Um, and of course we've shown uh, two proofs of proof of work constructions. Can we show that other proof of work constructions are also incompressible and can be used in this framework? Thank you. Many thanks for the nice talk. Are there any questions? Okay, I guess it was so simple that everyone understood <laughs> everything. <laughs> They're so blown away. So let's thank the speaker again. And the next talk is the invited talk. So please uh, go over.